Well, thank you to everyone for showing up to our Lagoon webinar on Lagoon Biosolids. Um, ready to get it started here. Uh, just a little uh, technology check before we get going. Uh, what can everybody see uh, my screen? That first slide, making meeting new Lagoon ammonia effluents the effect of biosolids on nitrification. If you could just put in your chat bar there, just let me know you could see it. Also, uh, I assume if you're in the chat bar there, you can uh, also hear me, which is good. Perfect. Okay, looks like everybody's, most people are good to go. Okay. We will get going here. So today we're going to uh, do a brief introduction in a triple point as per usual. Uh, this, uh, we're looking at biosolids, but we're looking at biosolids mainly as it pertains to ammonia removal and how, what the effect of biosolids is on ammonia removal. But it's really, and it, it's something that impacts BOD treatment. It's something that impacts all nutrient removal of any kind through the lagoon. So it, it's a, it, it is sort of broad in terms of its impact. Um, so we'll talk about ammonia removal first, then some of the issues with biosolids accumulation, uh, and then which ways how you can measure and remove sludge, uh, available ways that you can do that. So uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Triple Point, we believe that lagoons do it better. And uh, we know this is not the conventional engineering wisdom uh, that has been seen in the past, that people think lagoons are old technology and should be replaced because they can't meet the low BOD and nutrient limits that are out there and uh, they smell and, and, and issues associated with that. Well, what we found in our, you know, um, some of our engineers here when working with lagoons for, you know, over 30 years is that, um, you know, a properly designed and properly operated lagoon system can meet any BOD treatment effluent limit, any ammonia limit, any phosphorus limit, any total nitrogen limit that's out there. So we really see it as our mission to provide the technologies to lagoon systems to help meet those limits. And we feel that at the end of the day, upgrading a lagoon system is the most cost effective uh, and uh, solution from a capital point of view. And it, it's uh, also the most operational, um, the easiest thing to operate as a lagoon system. Um, so we're really looking for ways to help lagoons do it better, and, and we believe that they can produce the effluents that are necessary. So that's that's our goal, and and so we developed a, a whole series of technologies um, that you can see here on this slide, from our Mars aeration system, which I talked about in our last presentation. Uh, which is, you know, obviously designed to retrofit existing lagoon aeration systems uh, cost-effectively uh, to help them meet, uh, you know, just to rehabilitate, rehabilitate and increase efficiency or help meet more stringent BOD and TSS limits. Then we have our nitrox system for ammonia removal, our nitrox plus D for total nitrogen removal, and then our phosphox system there at the back. So we'll talk a little bit about the Mars system, a little bit about the nitrox system in this presentation as it pertains to lagoons, biosolids, but in nitrification. Um, but you know we've been able to uh, prove that lagoon can meet any treatment effluent requirement that's that, that that's being placed on it, and I think the lagoons can actually um, produce better effluent than a mechanical plant can uh, with the right equipment and operation in place. Um, so, further to our mission, we're out there really trying to educate and change the perception and change the the view of lagoons. And in doing so, we we produce you know informational blogs that come out every two weeks. I don't know if you guys read those, but they're really good. We have educational videos on YouTube. I am I am a YouTube star uh, personally, and we have I think up to I think there's about. 15 or so videos on YouTube right now. We're adding more and more, and we're going around the country and interviewing, you know, lagoon experts and, and trying to, to add value and help people operate their lagoon better and and, and so on. And we also do training events. Uh, these webinars are part of that. But we do on-site training events. We've got a training event coming up in um, Alabama uh, at uh, Talladega Super Motors uh, Speedway. 
uh, in the middle of October. A little bit more information on that later, but that's where we bring in an expert speaker to help train operators and engineers on lagoon operation, lagoon design, lagoon optimization. Uh, and they're very well attended and very, very highly rated. And then finally, we also have a Facebook group that we're trying to connect operators with operators so that we can get people helping each other out to try and solve problems. If you go to our website, go to tpeemb.com forward slash LDIB, uh, the address there at the bottom, you uh, can register f for our Lagoons Do It Better community, and we'll send you a free camo hat. So uh, it's a nice little, nice little free swag there if you're interested. So, um, so ammonia is, you know, a compound of nitrogen and hydrogen. And some of this might be a little bit of a, if you were at my last webinar, this would be a little bit of recap, but um, basically it's a colorless gas with a putrid smell. Um, so it's a gas in kind of its native form. When it gets into water, it's, uh, you know, most of it gets converted into the NH4 uh, which is ammonium, but some of it remains in this NH3 form. And it's this NH3 form which is particularly toxic to amphibious life. So it, uh, it'll impact fish and, and aquatic, certain aquatic species directly, and it's like poison. Uh, it's like a bullet to the head, uh, really, for a lot of this amphibious life. So uh, what we're trying to do when we're trying to remove ammonia is nitrify you know, in a, in a typical municipal wastewater system and in certain industrial processes. And that's the process of taking the ammonia and converting it into nitrite and then into nitrate. Um, and we do that using a specific type of bacteria called nitrifiers. Uh, Nitrosominus and nitrospector are the two sort of types that we're utilizing. So the name of the game when it comes to nitrification is really trying to create the conditions for the nitrifying bacteria to nitrify, right? And the way um, each of the options that are out there, you know, either it's a mechanical plant or whether it's uh, upgrading the lagoon to add a process to help nitrify, uh, all of those uh, alternatives are really looking for ways to create conditions in which you can nitrify uh, itself. Um, so the way we do that with our nitrox system is that we'll actually treat the BOD waste through the lagoons themselves, and then we will pull out of a secondary lagoon and run it through our two-stage nitrification process. And what this is is it's two complete mixed tanks um, that have very, very, very highly aerated, and they have uh, biomedia in them. Uh, biofilm carriers. So these are little pieces of, of HDPE plastic that the nitrifiers will actually grow on and attach to and live in. Um, and so by doing, by, by creating a lot of surface area for these nitrifiers to, to glom onto and to, to grow and to develop these uh, communities with, on this media, we're able to achieve a lot of nitrification because we got a lot of those nitrifiers there. Uh, in, in, in the tank itself. And then the aeration and mixing makes sure that the environment is 100% homogeneous, that you, you get the bacteria, the ammonia, uh, and the oxygen all together within this really small footprint tank, and then it flows out the other side. So we like this system because it's low foot, small footprint for nitrification purposes. It's um, cost effective. It's, you know, really, it's much lower cost than uh, most of the nitrification, uh, lagoon nitrification upgrade alternatives that are available. Um, typically it's about you know, two thirds of the cost or so. Uh, so it saves money and it's really simple to operate. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a pass through tank and if you can gravity feed in and out of the tanks, then it's even simpler. And really all you gotta do from an operational perspective is keep the blower running at any given time. Um, so that's the kind of way we do it, and, 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 and again, I mean, the, the idea here is we're trying to create the conditions for which the nitrifiers can nitrify, you know, uh, and nitrifiers, you know, are a different animal than your BOD heterotrophic bacteria that are in the game. The BOD eating heterotrophs will consume, you know, uh, less oxygen, they are not as 
uh, sensitive to temperature and to pH and certain conditions like that. They grow faster, and and they've been doing the job of BOD removal in lagoon systems for uh, for centuries. Um, and, and so they're very very uh, well adept. Nitrifiers, on the other hand, take longer to mature. They're less competitive for the oxygen and the food that's in the water, and they have specific needs. So when you kind of get those, you line up all these needs, this slides to serve a brief overview of these different conditions. You know, nitrifiers want a low BOD environment to, to work with, you know, 20 to 30 milligrams per liter. They want 4.6 pounds of oxygen per pound of ammonia, so significantly more oxygen than the heterotrophic bacteria do. And then they want a higher DO. You know, they want a 5, 6, 7 milligrams per liter residual dissolved oxygen in the water column as compared to the BOD eating uh, bacteria, which can, they, they're, they're perfectly happy in 0.5 DO uh, if, if they can get it, you know. Um, so, uh, mixing is really important with nitrification too because you've got to get the bacteria and the food and the and the oxygen in contact with with every with itself. And if you don't do that, you let it settle down to a bottom of a basin, it's not going to nitrify as easily. Um, nitrifiers are are particularly uh, sensitive to pH, and you need alkalinity in a nitrification process to to actually nitrify. So Nitrifiers will actually consume alkalinity as part of their the nitrification process. So you really need it between a six, uh, well, seven and eight, really, uh, six to seven, seven to eight kind of pH range to to effectively nitrify. And as soon as you get kind of out of that range, the nitrifiers become way less effective. They drop off very, very quickly. Um, temperature is important. Uh, theoretical minimum for nitrification is about 41 degrees Fahrenheit. Water temperature, you can maybe go down to 39 degrees or somewhere around 4 degrees C and still get the job done. But the nitrifiers really, really, really do slow down as it gets colder. And then finally, you know, just nitrifier mass, which means, you know, the more nitrifiers you have, the more nitrification you can achieve and the colder temperatures you can achieve them. You know, you just got to have more mouths to feed, right? So these are the basic conditions. And I mention this because, you know, sludge impacts these conditions. Sludge can have an impact on every single one of these things. Um, and so you're not going to get good nitrification if you don't deal with your biosolids within a lagoon system. So the common problems that you see with biosolids in a lagoon are kind of listed here. And I'm going to go into some of these in detail, a little bit more detail with individual slides. But to give you an overview, you've got benthol feedback. Uh, sludge uh, can lead to pH issues popping sludge and odors, algae growth, reduced treatment, and low dissolved oxygen. These are some of the common things that you see. Um, so to start, the first one is, and if you look at this graph here, this is sort of a really almost kind of common thing to see with in a, a lagoon system where your influent ammonia can be higher, sorry, can be lower than your effluent ammonia, right? And you're kind of sitting there and you're scratching your head and like, what do you mean? I mean, we're going through this wastewater process, right? We're aerating it, getting rid of the BOD. You know, we're maybe got a little bit of extra oxygen. We can do a little bit of nitrification. Our influent ammonia shouldn't be higher, lower than our effluent ammonia. Well, what this is, is this is benthol feedback. And what that benthol is really just a, it's a word that means kind of coming from the bottom, you know. Um, and so what what happens is you you build up sludge on the bottom, right? And as you build up sludge, it'll start to break down anaerobically without oxygen. And when it does, it'll actually release ammonia into the water column. So if you have a lot of sludge and it's just sitting there, you know, I'm talking about 18 inches plus of sludge, it'll actually release ammonia, it'll release phosphorus, it could release uh, a lot of different nutrients that, that could be end up being in the water column that cause you to have a treatment and almost ultimately a, a, an issue with your discharge permit. Um, and when we see this a lot is right now, right in, the, right in July, the hottest month of the year, is when you typically tend to see this kind of level of benthol feedback. And it's something to be aware of, and it's, a, it's, a very, it's an indication of too much sludge. 
so the the what, when you know how to know when you have too much sludge a lot of times you can just look at you know popping sludge so you can see in this picture here this is a lot of popping sludge uh, popping sludge is a technical term. I mean, it's not, but it's, it's floating sludge on the surface. And what happens is the the sludge itself will start to break down on the bottom and it will release H2S. And then the H2S will get caught underneath, the hydrogen sulfide will get caught underneath that, uh, that sludge and it will actually float it to the surface. Uh, and that's when you start seeing popping sludge. And, you know, immediately your... Um, it can fuel algal blooms later on in the process where you don't have the popping sludge. You can see uh, foul odors that occur. Um, obviously, you got sludge floating on the surface. As you can see here, this is pretty bad. Uh, probably some of the worst popping sludge I've seen at this facility. Um, and then you often see high BOD, NH3, and phosphorus on the effluent. Um, so it's, I'd say benthol feedback is probably the number one issue with uh, having too much lagoon biosolids. And the symptoms are pretty obvious, you know. Uh, it, having, if you have too much biosolids, you get a lot of odor, you get popping sludge, you can see an increase in your BOD and TSS on the effluent, uh, and you'll also see an increase in your ammonia as well. When sludge, you know, uh, when sludge starts to break down anaerobically, uh, in certain conditions, it can actually lower the pH, uh, which then can have an impact on your biological treatment, both for BOD and for uh, nitrification. Um, so it's a big, it, you know, it doesn't just impact it indirectly, it'll impact it directly by lowering the pH as well. So it's a big concern. And so, you know, when do you have Benthol feedback, I, I would say, you know, on average, and it, it, it does depend because, and we'll get into this a little later in the presentation, but it depends on the level of volatile to non-volatile solids that you have within your lagoon, right? Volatile solids being the ones you can actually break down organically, non-volatile being the ones you can't. Things like sand, grit, uh, things that find your in, in their way into your lagoon over the course of 20 years. Um, but generally speaking, to generalize, you know, you're looking at a sludge blanket of about 18 inches, dissolved oxygen of less than two, and a water temperature over 60 degrees. That's when you tend to see the biggest issues. Those, that's sort of your recipe for disaster when it comes to sludge uh, within a lagoon. So to test, you can test for benthol feedback. You, you know, you can obviously test your influent and effluent uh, in and out of your lagoon itself. Uh, to see if you're getting, you know, like, for example, ammonia is a really, really good bellwether for uh, benthol feedback. Uh, if you if you have a lot of sludge, you will release ammonia and your ammonia will go higher. But sometimes, you know, it's good to do, we recommend doing intra-pond testing, right? So you can see what's happening. What's happening in your first pond, right? You, got, you know what your influent is. You test what's coming out of your first pond. You do BOD, TSS, ammonia. And then you go to the second pond, do the same thing, and then finally last pond, same thing. So if you have these intrapond testing, you can kind of see where, you know, this kind of shows you a polishing pond. This is actually a, a system that um, we're putting a nitrox system in right now. Uh, this is before the nitrox system got in, obviously, since we haven't put it in yet. But we, I looked at that. I had testing from after cell two. And I had testing after the polishing pond. And this pond had, this lagoon system had not been dredged in 20 years. And as you can see, you know, from this, the blue line being the influent, you know, what's coming out of cell two, the red line being the effluent, there were times in which you saw some, some ammonia uh, coming out of, uh, higher ammonia coming out of cell, uh, out of the effluent than the coming into it. And that's a telltale sign, you know. So I really recommend if, if you're concerned about sludge, do this intrapond testing. It's really, really helpful. Even if, you know, you're not seeing benthol feedback, you know, and, and that could well be, um, you know, but you haven't removed sludge in 20 years, you know, it could well be that you that most of your sludge component is non-volatile, so sand, grit, inorganic material, okay? 
Now, this can still impact your treatment um, because, you know, typically a lagoon is designed with about two feet of sludge storage in it. Most states require 24 inches of what we call sludge storage, which means that, you know, that that you have that water depth there, but, you know, you're, the, the engineer who designed your system did not uh, give credit for the treatment calculations of that bottom two feet of water, right? Now, if, as you build up sludge over time, right, even if it's inorganic, it starts to take away volume from the pond, right? So if you get it above 24 inches or if you only had 16 inches of sludge storage designed in, you got 18 inches of sludge storage uh, that's happening, it, that's going to take away from your treatment volume, right, which is going to lower your retention time, right? The basic lagoon process is a function of time, right, and air, right, oxygen in the water column. So that's how the biological treatment calculations work. So if you have less time to treat the water, then you get higher BOD on the effluent. So this is this is also a very, very common problem to see when you have start seeing higher BOD on the effluent. It's just not having enough retention time because you've got too much sludge. Um, so that's a that's a big uh, big driver. This The other thing is low dissolved oxygen. Right? If you have a lot of organics in it, you typically see a lot of low dissolved oxygen because you know the even if you have aeration in your system currently, right, if you have a lot of sludge and a lot of volatile components of the sludge, chances are that your aeration is not sized correctly or sized large enough to meet that undigested BOD which is sitting on the bottom. Right? So and this just happens. Lagoons they are designed with sludge storage, right? They're designed to accumulate sludge over time. So eventually you do have to remove it. But you'll see persistent dissolved oxygen within a lagoon, despite how much you aerate it or how much you operate, you know, maybe you do put a couple more aerators out there, maybe with the existing aeration that you have, because the BOD demand in your lagoon is the incoming BOD plus the accumulated BOD plus the dissolved oxygen buffer. And your aeration system was likely only designed for the incoming BOD, not the BOD that's sitting on the bottom currently that built up over the course of 20 years. So that is a big, big driver for why dissolved oxygen tends to be low, persistently low, even if you feel like you have enough aeration out there or you're operating with the amount of design horsepower that, of aeration that you're supposed to be, right? Uh, and, and in large part, and I covered this in the Fundamentals of the Lagoon Aeration webinar, in large part, that's because most lagoons are are what we call partial mixed aerated lagoons, which means they're not fully mixed. So you do accumulate sludge, and that's just part of the plan when you when you put it in place. So when is it time to remove sludge? Um, and I think you know if you see evidence of significant benthol feedback, you're seeing higher BOD and TSS, you're seeing popping sludge, you're seeing you know, obviously a lot of odors, uh, increased turbidity in general, like if the pond looks like it's a black hole, well, that's an anaerobic pond, right? That's an anaerobic lagoon, and that is, you know, you got to think about either aerating that or you got to think about removing sludge in that. Um, so all these things, you got excessive algal growth, uh, they're all signs that maybe you got a sludge issue. And I would say, uh, the large majority of in municipal lagoons, the large majority of treatment issues have something to do with sludge, <laughs> um, because this is the th this is the variable that's often unknown, because nobody measures it, um, that can be having a big impact on your treatment numbers. So you know how quickly you accumulate sludge, and and you know you could sit down and and. Theoret the theoretically figure out, right, what what would be the sludge level, you know? And, and the things that affect sludge buildup are the age of the lagoon, obviously, the more time, the more sludge you likely built up. The organic loading, the hydraulic loading, you know, uh, the, the retention time, basically within the lagoon is what we're getting at there. The ge geometry of the lagoon, the climate that you're in. If it's a hotter climate, you can digest sludge uh, quicker, both aerobically and anaerobically, so you tend to get as much sludge buildup or as quickly. Um, oxygen and mixing, 
uh, metals or, or anything like toxicity, anything, if you have anything toxic coming into your lagoon, if you've got, you know, we just did a, a meth lab waste uh, blog uh, that's going to be sent out today. And, you know, if you had a meth lab on your system, it'll come in and the, if you, you get those chemicals in your lagoon, it'll kill the biology in your lagoon, right, which obviously will increase the amount of sludge build up you got. Um, so metals and toxicity in general are big, uh, big drivers, um, and just the amount of solids that's in your waste. Uh, you can. This is a table with some research on it that we uh, that we found that kind of gives you a ballpark just based on research studies of you know what you can expect uh, sludge buildup within your lagoon. Um, and uh, there's a reference to this at the end. We're going to do a video. Uh, we're producing a recording of this webinar, so you you can come back to this later. We'll put it on our YouTube channel. You can come back to this table later. But you know there is some some general sense of what you know the type what you could expect. And again, it's affected by geometry. It's affected by weather. It's affected by a lot of things. But it, it'll give you an understanding just theoretically what you should expect to see. Excuse me. So, why to measure sludge? And I, I think the reason I put this slide out is a lot of people are hesitant to measure sludge. You know, it's kind of hard, it's not easy to do, and, and it's hard to do accurately. Uh, but it's really, really critical because you got to know what where your pond is at, where your lagoon is at, right? Um, you know, if you can get ahead of it, say, you know, today you don't have any of these issues that I just outlined, right? You want to know when you're going to have these issues so that you can start planning from a financial perspective when you need to go in and remove sludge, right? Or when you need to start thinking about doing something about your sludge. So it's really, really important. And, you know, we have a saying around here at Triple Point. We say good data, good decisions, right? And, and we, it's one of our core values and we live by it. And you got to have good data on this kind of thing because it's such a it's such a big issue. If you ignore it, it's such a big issue later on down the road. Um, so, and then finally, it, you know, this kind of data, if you get down the road and you do have to remove sludge, having a good, accurate understanding of how much sludge you've got in your lagoon is critical to getting an accurate and cost-effective bid for removing that sludge. I've had a few projects in the past, and, and we don't do, we're not dredging contractors. We you know, we kind of advise on lagoon sludge, but we don't do anything with it, where, you know, there was no sludge measurement done on the lagoon, yet the customer wanted sludge to be removed from the lagoon. Well, if you're a dredging contractor and you don't know how much sludge is in the lagoon, you have to assume there's a lot of sludge in the lagoon. Otherwise, you're not going to go ahead and put a accurate bid quote in right? Because you don't know how much sludge there is there. And when it comes to removing sludge, it's all about the number of cubic yards you got. It's all about the volatile, the non-volatile component, where they can put it, things like that. So this data is critical uh, in order to, uh, to to bid something properly. So I'm going to go through three options for measuring sludge in the lagoon. Um, sludge judging, uh, using a SETCHI disk, and then uh, sonar using a more like a sonar depth finder type type sludge measurement. So the first thing is sludge judging and everybody knows sludge judging. You can go on USA Blue Book, you can go buy yourself a sludge judge. Now sludge judges are better for taking core samples than they are for actually measuring the sludge depth. And the reason is is because there's a little valve on the bottom of that sludge judge, right? And it, when you push it down into your sludge, it requires pressure to open the valve up, right? And and so and and then also the size of the uh, valve, the, the orifice, the opening of that, uh, is only so big. So you don't, generally speaking, get a very good accurate representation of the total sludge depth by sticking a sludge judge into the sludge and then pulling it up. You're you're likely there's only so much material that can fit through that valve um, that you're only likely to be, you know, about 75% accurate uh, with the total sludge depth. And total sludge depth is important because um, it can give you a sense of the total volume. You know, if you, I'll get onto that in a minute, but um, 
we like sludge judging because you can get good core samples from it. You can get an, a sense of you want to get a sample of the sludge, you put it in a bucket, you send it to a lab, they look at it and they say, okay, well, this is how much of this sludge is volatile, which means organic can be broken down. This is how much is non-volatile. They'll also run it for all sorts of different types of heavy metals, uh, which is important for land applying later. If you're going to take your sludge off site, you know, what you can do with it depends largely as uh, upon the composition of that sludge. So sludge judges are really good for for that. And it's, you know, fairly simple. It's a big rod. You're in a boat, you stick it down in a little lagoon, and, and you pull it back up, and you get a good good core sample out of it. What we like for testing sludge depth is usually using a SETI disc. Now, a SETI disc is typically used to measure turbidity within uh, a water column. So you'll put the disc in, you look at it, and you, you lower it down a foot, lower it down a foot, lower it down a foot to see how far you could see the disc into the actual water column. Well, we recommend using it for actually measuring sludge depth because the disc will actually sink, right? It'll sink, and you can put it all the way down to the bottom, and it'll sit on top of the sludge once it gets down to the bottom. And then you take the, you, you put your hand on the rope, you pull it back up, you measure the rope, right? And that's how much effective depth you've got. Then to figure out what the sludge depth is, you take the total depth, right? And you minus out the effective depth, and then the, the delta is your sludge depth, right? And this is a good way of doing it because it's going to give you the, you know, it doesn't rely on, on a valve or on, on sludge getting through a two-inch orifice, right? Well, like you have on the sludge judge. It just relies on the thing being able to sink down to the bottom and sit on top of the sludge. Um, so this is a very, very effective method of, of testing the sludge depth within a lagoon, and I really prefer this to the sludge judge uh, where possible. The final method is actually using a sonar depth finder. So similar to kind of like a fish finder on a boat, uh, maybe a little bit more industrial, um, and you can get out there and what it does is, it, you know, there's very different methods to it. You know, some use ultrasonic pulses that'll, you know, pulse down to the bottom and then take take uh, take in the the re the respond the response from the floor of the lagoon. Some of them, you know, use infrared. Uh, there's very different various different kinds, and we've looked into this over the years because we're really interested in sludge depth too. You know, we want to figure out how much sludge is in our lagoons before we put aeration systems into them, or or whatever. But what we found is that if, if you want to get an accurate read using a sonar depth finder or an infrared sensor, you have to spend quite a bit of money to get something decent. Not only that, but you've got to calibrate it too because there's different levels of sensitivity, right, based on the density of the sludge. Um, so it's not really something that you can just set up and every lagoon is the same. you got to get out there in a boat, shoot a couple spots, and then verify those spots. Right, using your sludge, uh, using your SETI disc, to, in order to calibrate the, uh, the the strength of the signal to get an accurate depth measurement. Um, and so, um, you know, we actually just recently looked into this, and I mean, we you could spend a hundred thousand dollars on on this equipment if you wanted to. Uh, you could also spend, you know, twenty dollars or forty dollars at you know, Gander Mountain and get yourself a, you know, a, a bobber one that you can cast out there and, and it'll take a depth for you. But, you know, the more money you spend, the more effort you put into this technology, the more accurate it's going to be. Uh, at the end of the day, it needs to be accurate and that's the goal. And it can be hard to get it right uh, with the equipment that's available, currently available on the market. But this image here shows you what it could look like. Uh, in terms of uh, where the sludge depth is around a lagoon, and it also has the promise of being a little bit faster potentially than uh, than going out and doing measurements. I think the the key is you can't you know if people want to make this process easy, uh, like you see this guy here just hanging out on the shore and he's just driving his little you know little boat around. It all sounds well and good, right? But you're not going to get accurate sludge measurements. You got to get into the lagoon. You got to get your hands dirty, right? And you got to take these these measuring uh, points. 
Um, and typically we'd recommend somewhere anywhere between 18 and 20 measuring points per lagoon. So this shows you a lagoon actually in Arizona. Our good friend Steve Harris, who's, who, who we actually bring in to do the lagoon trainings, uh, he's a lagoon expert, been doing lagoons for 30 years, uh, consults with a lot of uh, lagoon owners and also with states and regulators on lagoon treatment and helps them optimize tr lagoon treatment. And so this is his, he did this measurement on this lagoon in Arizona, and those are in inches. So he took, you know, 24 uh, testing points uh, or or 18 testing points across these two lagoons and um, put them, mapped them out on the lagoon like this, and this was all done manually in a boat. You know, it took maybe a day end-to-end uh, -to, -end to do it, um, but extremely accurate. You know, he's got a really, really good sense. And, you know, it, 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 this data makes sense, too. You know, you look at it on the left-hand side, the influent, it's, you know, 14 inches sludge buildup. As you go across the lagoon and get closer towards the back on the right-hand side, the sludge buildup's less, which, which makes sense, right? Um, so this is kind of the way to do it. Um, I think if you can get a good sonar, I mean, Steve uses the sonar uh, system sometimes too. Um, it, it can work, but you ultimately you got to get out of a boat. You got to take these, uh, you got to set up a grid and take these measurement points to get an accurate read. So once you have your sludge um, depth measured, uh, now you got to think about, well, do we need to remove it? No, it's assuming that you do. There's several different ways to remove it. Uh, and there's really two components to it. It's removing it and it's disposing of it, right? Uh, that you got to think about. And, you know, sludge itself is, you know, largely water. Uh, and so dewatering is a big, big thing because you don't want to haul water, right? Hauling water is expensive. It's heavy. Uh, it has more volume. Uh, if you can dewater it on site, then obviously you get you get better treatment. So um, when you look at you know dry dredging versus wet dredging, um, it really comes down to what you can do with your system, right? Um, dry dredging can be a lot easier. Uh, you could be more accurate. You can the thing about dry dredging is is you can see that the sludge is gone, right? It's wet dredging. It, the problem with wet dredging is you can't actually see, you know, and so the contractor could be down there hoovering up the sludge on the bottom with his vacuum cleaner. You could miss some spots, right? He could, uh, you know, he could only remove half the sludge he needs to. He could puncture the liner, all these things, and you just don't know what's going on because you can't see it. It's all under five feet or six feet or ten feet of water. Um, so dry dredging is can be easier, and it can be also be a little bit more accurate and a little bit more um, precise. Um, however, obviously, you got to take a cell offline, right? And you've got to have somewhere to put that water in the meantime as you're dredging it. Um, wet dredging, you know, no, you don't have to take the cell offline. You can keep it in operation and actually get in there. And it'll, you know, you got a little barge and it's just, you know, literally just pumping water from the bottom and and uh, threw a pump on top of this barge. And, um, you know, if you get a good dredging contractor, this is a perfectly valid approach uh, and one that, that's used quite commonly, uh, actually, um, and, and can work really, really well. It also depends on, you know, wet dredge versus dry dredge. Is, you know, what kind of aeration equipment do you have? Do you have surface aerators that are on the surface? Well, then it, you know, matters less because, you know, the wet dredge is not really going to help hurt them. If you've got diffusers on the bottom and you're not replacing your diffusers, then you got to be concerned about the dredge getting down in there and having to work around where the diffusers are without breaking them, right? So it depends on the infrastructure you've got on the bottom as well, and that's you know it's pretty critical to to getting a decent uh, you know d decent number out of a contractor that's going to be cost effective. So once you get the, the sludge out, you got to dewater it. Uh, and there's really two main ways of doing that. Mechanical dewatering using, you know, like a, a belt uh, belt press um, or a centrifuge or, you know, a number of ways. And usually what credit contractors do, they'll, they'll bring this equipment in on a mobile skid of some kind and, and actually dewater it there. The water obviously goes back into the lagoon. The sludge gets removed, you know, gets put into a dump truck and, and removed to a landfill or for land application. Um, the other way is, you know, I, I show this in my 
my picture here is what's called a geotube. And this is kind of a newer technology, but definitely one that's gained a lot of, a lot of interest and has been around a decent amount of time where it's proven where you can you pump the sludge into the tube and what it does is it doesn't let water seep into the tube, but it'll let water seep out. So these tubes just sit on the side of your lagoon and you leave them there for a year uh, or six months and they'll just dewater themselves over time. You know, the sun will beat down on the tube and water will evaporate or some of the water will seep out of the geotube and into the lagoon. And so uh, this is uh, quite popular as a method. I like it a lot. Uh, it doesn't require any mechanical equipment to do it, pump it into the tube. You do have to use polymers, and polymers are a dark science, which I do not pretend to understand. Um, but if you don't get the right polymers, uh, you can really uh, – it really has a big impact on your, on your, uh, on your ability to dewater, both uh, with mechanical and with the on-site dewatering with this geotube. But assuming you get that de that that polymer mix right, it's it is uh, very effective and cost effective. And eventually, once it's dewatered, you can pick up the geotube, haul it off site, and do what you got to do with it at that point. Um, and it's all the water is gone. So it can be a a nice solution in a lot of cases. So alternatives to dredging, and you know this really depends on again. You know, once you, you measure your sludge, once you have a breakdown of the volatile and non-volatile components of the sludge, once you've analyzed what's in the sludge, you can kind of determine, well, can we, what can we do with, to, uh, maybe we don't have, you know, a lot of sludge, or maybe we have 50% volatile solids in our sludge. So 50% of that sludge can be broken down. We just haven't been able to break it down in the lagoon. Um, so you could look at three different things I'll, I'll mention here. You know, install a lagoon aeration, uh, limit solids buildup, and and slash or build, put in some bioaugmentation to try and break down that sludge. So our marsh system is designed to, you know, it's got two components to it. It's got a fine bubble EPDM membrane diffuser, which is efficient at transferring oxygen to water, so it's an efficient aerator. But in the middle, it's got what's called a coarse bubble static tube. And what that coarse bubble static tube is, and this is where this is where it pertains to to mixing and helping to 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 uh, lower the amount of um, volatile solids in your lagoon. Is this coarse hole static tube will actually circulate water almost like an airlift uh, pump through the tube itself, and actually not only does that help to get some of the sludge off the bottom and put it to the water column, some of the lighter, fluffier sludge where it can be broken down with oxygen and mixing but it also helps to circulate water so that higher dissolved oxygen water can get down to the bottom reaches of the lagoon itself. And so when you have higher dissolved oxygen water down there, you'll actually get a, a lot of aerobic digestion, which is fairly quick uh, in terms of its ability to break down uh, organics. Um, so this, we did some CFD modeling on our Mars unit, and um, you can see here that you know, how the water moves in and around the Mars unit itself. It really does help to pull water from the sides, push it towards the surface, which then get, comes back down and drops back down to the lagoon. So this creates mixing, this creates good efficient aeration, uh, and it can really, really help reduce the amount of uh, volatile solids you've got in your lagoon. Uh, this is a different, different view of it here. Um, more of a, a side view uh, of the unit. So it's, um, you know, if you can increase the amount of oxygen, if you can get oxygen to this biomass, then you can certainly uh, reduce the amount of volatile solids. And if you can remove, reduce the amount of volatile solids, that'll help you obviously prolong dredging, right? So, you, you know, you don't have to dredge for another 10 years or another 15 years, right? Which increases the interval of dredging, which saves you money. Um, and also can help mitigate some of these issues with sludge that could affect you in the long term, things like benthol feedback and so on. The second thing is a lot of times with lagoons, you know, a big component of the sludge could be stuff that's really hard to break down. It can be plastics. It could be, uh, you know, wet wipes or, or trash bags or things like that that find them way, their way into your sludge. So, you know, we always recommend putting a screen up front to try and remove some of those items, right? The screen will remove these kinds of solids that get into your lagoon that will 
constitute will build you know help build up sludge faster, but also it'll remove a lot of BOD load with it, right? Because all these things have a BOD component to them. So if you can pull those items out, you can reduce your BOD by 25% on the input, which helps you not only not accumulate these things in the bottom of your lagoon, but also um, it helps you to treat better because you have less BOD coming in your system. So this kind of screen will, will actually, and there's lots of different types of screens, and I'm not a screen expert, so I can't answer a lot of questions on screens, but it will remove those solids, dump it into a trash bag, and then you haul it off site. And it can be a really, really effective uh, solution to, to limiting BOD and improving treatment. Finally, you could look at, there's a lot of companies out there that provide bio-augmentation products that'll, which are essentially just more bugs uh, that you can put into your lagoon and uh, they'll actually help to break down sludge. Now, I would say that, you know, there's a lot of snake oil in the bacteria and enzyme business and there's a lot of companies that have reported to be able to do uh, you know, sludge reduction just by adding this bacteria uh, that aren't actually that effective at it. Um, oh, crap. Sorry, it looks like we have a... Okay, sorry, I'm resharing the screen here. All right, sorry about that. All right, I'm back. <laughs> Sorry about those technical difficulties. I don't know why that just happened. Um, okay, can you guys see my screen now again? Cool, thank you. Uh, I'll back up a few slides, okay. Let me back up a few slides. Where should I back up to? Do you want the screen slide or the CFD modeling slide? Okay. Okay, CFD modeling. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I was saying that you know, one of the methods, and you, you heard me earlier, was kind of you could install aeration you know, aeration and, and increase the, the amount of oxygen and mixing you've got in your lagoon. Uh, and by doing so, you can help break down some of the volatile component of that sludge. So the MARS unit, you know, has the central static tube component, which is designed to be kind of like a mild airlift pump effect. So as we pump a coarse bubble through the tube, as you can see in the CFE model, it actually pulls water from underneath the unit and pushes it towards the surface. Right, and so that'll actually pull liquefied and, and, and some of the less dense sludge that hasn't compacted and push it towards the surface. And once it gets into that water column, the, the bacteria and the oxygen are freely available right there with this food to really break down. Um, so it really creates a really nice environment for this breakdown to occur. And so uh, not only does that have a direct impact on the sludge underneath the unit, but it also helps to bring higher levels of dissolved oxygen down to the bottom of the lagoon. So we're creating this circulation. So we're circulating this water, then we're adding oxygen, we're circulating, adding oxygen. So the water, once it gets to the top, will actually come down the side and drop down to the bottom where it gives the uh, area around the Mars unit within its effective area more oxygen. And just generally speaking, helps the lagoon have more oxygen in it, which helps to increase aerobic digestion. So this is a really, uh, you know, we've been doing, the you know, the Mars unit here for, for 20 years uh, since it's kind of been out. And um, we've seen a lot of interesting effects where we pull down lagoons and see the Mars unit sitting on the bottom. It's almost like it's got a crater around it where it's kind of, kind of you know, circulated and, and helped to get itself down to the liner of the lagoon itself um, and break down a lot of sludge that way. Um, so that really helps to obviously, you know, reduce the total sludge volume, um, by reducing the organic component of that sludge, which helps to prolong this, this, the uh, sludge removal uh, needs that you have over a longer period of time. The second thing is to, to add a screen. You know, screening will help remove rags, trash bags, wet wipes, 
you know, all sorts of different organic material that otherwise would contribute to the sludge layer on the bottom if they were allowed just to pass through the system. Uh, it can help with your aerators too. You know, every aeration system has issues with ragging depending on your site. Uh, ragging can really does negatively impact the, the, the operation of the aeration system. It requires more maintenance that way. It can burn up motors. It can do a lot of things. Um, but ultimately, it also removes BOD. By removing these organic components, they don't have to be broken down in the lagoon. That helps to limit, you know, lower the sludge accumulation rate and also remove BOD and help your whole treatment process work more correctly. Uh, a lot of times these systems can be, you know, put into an existing channel uh, where if you have a manual bar, bar screen now, you can put a, you know, put a, an electric uh, um, operated um, screen in there. I'm not a screen expert, but certainly they're relatively easy to install and they can be very effective. And it just pulls the, 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 the debris out of the water squeezes the water out of it and dumps it into a trash can. So it's pretty easy to operate overall. Finally, uh, bio-augmentation. So, you know, there are a lot of companies out there that are purported to sell bacteria that can help remove sludge. You know, uh, I'm, I just, I ask people to be cautious about this stuff because there's a lot of snake oil out there where it's, you know, this magic pixie dust. You just throw it in the lagoon and it just vaporizes all the sludge. Well, First of all, you, you know, you're only going to break down the volatile components, you know, and anybody who's trying to sell you bacteria who's not asking the question of, uh, you know, how much volatile to non-volatile sludge do you have? How much of your sludge can be broken down with, with biology and how much of it can't? How much, of it, how much of it is just sand, grit, you know, inorganics? If they're not asking that question, they're trying to sell you sludge reducers, bacteria, they're, they're, and they're telling you that you can get 50% removal of that sludge, they're lying to you because they don't know is the bottom line, right? Because unless you have that analysis, you really can't know because you can only break down the organic components, not the non-organic components, right? So um, I think there's, there's a lot of companies out there that sell this stuff. There's very few that are good at it. Um, this graph here shows you a company uh, that uh, seems to be relatively good at it and will actually guarantee their level of sludge reduction uh, within your lagoon. We work a lot with Aquafix, a company out of uh, Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, we actually have some YouTube videos of Aquafix either up on our YouTube channel or, or coming up on our YouTube channel. Uh, we visited them. We've used their products. We've, we, we feel comfortable that they are not selling snake oil, that they have a, a legit uh, solution. Um, so if you're interested in sludge reducers, you can call Aquafix. They'll give you a basic understanding of what to do, how to do it. Uh, it's pretty easy to, to put in bacteria into a lagoon. Um, and uh, if you mention triple point, you'll actually get a 20% discount on your first order. Um, so feel free to drop my name and drop triple point's name as you call them. Now, I will say that, you know, you're, you know this breakdown for it to be effective does require oxygen mixing, right? Simply throwing bacteria into a lagoon is not going to be particularly effective at breaking down sludge, right? The bacteria need mixing so they can get access to the food. They need oxygen so that they can uh, use that oxygen in the food to really respire quickly. So uh, this can help, but it may, it may only be half as effective or a quarter as effective to put in the uh, bacteria than it is to aerate and put in the bacteria. So um, just want to make you aware of that. We are looking for sites to potentially uh, test out the sludge removal capabilities of the Mars system. Um, and, you know, we've done a lot of anecdotal work on it, but we haven't done any direct before and afters. So if anybody's interested, contact me after this uh, webinar and we, we can talk about it, uh, potentially maybe even doing a rental scenario where we can come in and put the aeration in and do before and after sludge measurements. So, so just to wrap up here, sorry about technical difficulties. I don't know why my computer just disconnected, even though it's hardlined into the internet. Um, you know, I'd say if you get lagoon biosol build up of, of more than 18 inches, it's likely that you need sludge removal. Um, and this can, you know, impact your BOD treatment. It can impact your 
uh, your ammonia and other nutrient treatment. Um, and so you, you want to get ahead of it. I really recommend that you get ahead of it. You figure out today, if you don't have a problem today, figure out how much sludge you've got in your lagoon. Use these testing methods to figure it out so that you can have this as a planning tool as to when you would need to remove sludge before it gets to this, you know, mission critical point where you're, you're busting limits. Um, and so that's, uh, those are kind of the main conclusive points with that. Uh, just want to make you aware of a few events before I move on to the Q&A. We have another webinar at the end of next month, Getting New Life Out of Aging Lagoon Systems. This is going to be done by Tom Doherty, who's um, our, uh, our guy out of Spokane, Washington. Great guy, great presentation, really highly recommend it. You'll see it coming over your email. Uh, we're going to the Process Expo in Chicago. If you're any industrial people are on the line, please stop by our booth. Uh, we'll be sending information about that in an email. And then obviously WefTech in October if you're coming there. And then finally, we're hosting an on-site training at the Talladega Motor Speedway on October 17th with Steve Harris presenting. If you're in Georgia, Alabama, or Tennessee, highly recommend it. 99% uh, of people that come love it. So uh, with that, I will leave it to questions. If you want to type them into the chat bar here. So the first question I see here is from Ed Weinberg. Uh, he's asking, uh, how does the SRT compare with and without the Mars? Uh, do we have um, volatile solid data, a difference between uh, with age, um, and do bioaugmentation uh, supplements work with low DO? I'd say on the first one, so. SRT, I, I assume that means standard retention time. Um, hey, I'm not too up on the nomenclature of that. Um, it might help break down some of that sludge. So over time, you'll see the, your retention time increase because you will uh, destruct some of the volatile solids components. Uh, we do not have any data on volatile solid destruction with Mars units. Um, you know, uh, we have anecdotal data uh, where they pull the sludge, that, you know, the lagoon down for maintenance or, or something, and they, they've seen the Mars unit has created a little, you know, spot for it around it where it's cleared a lot of that sludge out of the way. Um, so we know it's mixing. We know it's uh, breaking down these components, but we don't have any data to, to do before and after. We're actually doing a project here this fall where we're going to get that data. Um, Bioaugmentation supplements can work in low dissolved oxygen conditions. I think uh, their effectiveness is dependent upon the amount of oxygen they, that you have in the lagoon and the amount of mixing, right? Can't stress how important mixing is. Mixing is so critical. Uh, if you get good mixing, it's just like an anaerobic digester, you know, or even in a aerobic digester. If you get good mixing, you get enhanced treatment. So uh, mixing is critical. So it's, it, bioaugmentation supplements can work without all that stuff, but they are a lot more effective with it, uh, up to two, two to probably five times more effective. I would say uh, and this next question is about uh, having, you said you have indicated a sludge depth of sampling density of 18 uh, different points in the lagoon. Do you have a sense of the number of samples needed to characterize sludge metal concentration and volatile solids? Um, I would say the more core samples you can take of the sludge, the more accurate your uh, your sludge is going to be. Uh, a volatile solids test, and, and it's, you know, it depends how much money you want to spend on it. A volatile solids test is very inexpensive at a lab. It's 15, 20 bucks. If you're trying to get metal concentrations, that can be more expensive. But if you had 18 different sludge depth measuring points and you had 18 different core samples that could be analyzed at the lab, the more accurate it's going to be, more data, more accurate, right? If you did nine core sample tests, then that would be better than doing one. So I would suggest 
that you do uh, as many core samples as you can to get a sense of how much metal is in your sludge, really. Um, more, more testing, the better. Next question I've got is, um, does benthol feedback affect what happens is less than 18, when the sludge is less than 18 inches or, or more or equal to 18 inches? So I think you, so you see the impacts of benthol feedback within a lagoon as sludge builds up. So it's not like there's this, you know, fine line where if it's at 18.1 inches, all of a sudden your lagoon blows up, you know, versus, you know, 17.9 inches. Uh, it really is a, you know, across the continu continuum kind of thing. The more sludge you, as you build up more and more sludge, the more benthol feedback that you, impacts that you see on the lagoon treatment, right? Um, and that just makes sense, right? And then it also depends, obviously, again, it comes back to benthol feedback is directly related to the amount of volatile solids you have in your lagoon. If you have a lot of inorganic solids, say in grit and things like that, they're not going to impact you from the benthol feedback point of view uh, because they're not going to break down anaerobically. Um, so it just depends. It depends how much you know volatile solids you have, but also it, it, it does as sludge builds up, every inch that's added, the more impact you're going to see from benthol feedback. Any other questions? Um, can you uh, comment on sludge judge competitors using true core? or core taker? Uh, I can't, uh, I haven't uh, looked recently, but I would say that, you know, anything like that is designed to take a core sample of the sludge and not necessarily designed to take a sludge depth. So uh, you will not, you will likely not get an accurate sludge depth measurement by using anything that's designed to take a core sample out of the look in. So I just caution against that. Uh, I really think the SETI disc is the best way to get a sludge depth, and and uh, the sludge judge is the best way to get a core sample. Uh, any con experience with the Mars units on pulp and paper lagoons? Uh, we have not put any Mars units in pulp and paper lagoons. Um, we actually recently developed a variation to the Mars unit that does not use a uh, fine bubble, but uses what's called a medium bubble. Um, and it's designed to be more robust uh, in a industrial application, a harsh industrial application like pulp and paper. So we've deployed this unit in several facilities, not pulp and paper, but ones where we've got some really recalcitrant wastewater and the medium bubble diffuser it will not clog. Uh, it's non-clogging so it uh, it happens to be it's a pretty happy medium between getting more aeration efficiency um, which is what you're looking for you know in, a, in an industrial application where you've got a lot of surface areas a lot of horsepower out there but not in necessarily increasing your maintenance uh, still lowering your maintenance so we've seen a lot of success with uh, utilizing this um, and uh, good oxygen transfer not quite as good as fine bubble but but, but better than a surface aerator. So you could say, you know, maybe 20% uh, on your horsepower, but also reduce the amount of motors you have on the water. So you wouldn't have any motors in the water. You just have two or three blowers on shore. So we're looking for applications to use pulp and paper. Very, very confident that it would be effective in the application. Just haven't uh, haven't got out there and done it. So we're looking for definitely for some pilot sites for anybody that should be interested. If you're interested, John, give me a give me a call after this. Um, Bruce uh, Brotherton says uh, he asked the question of I see in USA Blue Book that it has a two pound weight on it. Our our margin actually weighs two hundred pounds. I don't 
we're not actually in the USA Blue Book. Um, if a micro bubble were to be put in before your system, would that help? So, a micro bubble is uh, going to transfer more oxygen to water, right? Uh, in lagoons, that's uh, not necessarily a, a helpful thing because lagoons are so big, you need that mixing. So you could take a tanker load of pure oxygen, right, and, you know, plumb up, you know, release it right in the middle of the lagoon, you know, and you might theoretically have all the pounds of oxygen you need to treat the incoming BOD. But if you don't have mixing, and, and, and mixing being the vehicle by which the oxygen, the bacteria, and the organic matter come into contact with each other, it really doesn't matter how much oxygen you have. You're not going to break down the BOD and get the treatment results that you need. Uh, and you're also not going to break down the sludge. So I think, you know, microbubbles are good, but maybe not the best application. The lagoon is not the best application for that. Okay, the Sechi disc. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, no, that's uh, that's in USA Blue Book. Yeah, about two pounds. Uh, yeah, that's they're about you know you want the Sechi disc heavy enough to sink, but not too heavy that it's going to sink down into the sludge too much. Any other questions? Okay, well, thanks for joining us. Uh, my email and phone number is on the screen here. Uh, let me know if you got any questions. Be happy to answer. Uh, we'll be putting this video up on YouTube as well, so we'll, we'll email out a link to that once uh, once it's up there. And you know, thanks for coming. I hope to see you at the next uh, webinar. It's actually going to be given by Tom Doherty, so I'll probably be listening in on it. Uh, if you guys ever have a project to do with lagoons, we're here to be a resource, even if we can't help you. With any equipment, you know, we're more than happy to give you some advice. Uh, just uh, give me a shout. Thanks, and uh, have a great rest of your day.